On today's World Insight, a new mission on the 50th anniversary of the World Economic Forum in Davos, what it means for stakeholders in a sustainable world. But today we are living in a different world because people have different expectations. I think it should be a sustainable deal I mean, because it's clearly on the US side, I think the US need a deal. And the power of joy and hope through music. A female conductor makes audiences stop, look, and listen. Start to think about your breathing, and you focus on that. You know your ears open up. Do you feel it as you're breathing? Hello, and welcome to Davos Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Our special program is coming from the Swiss mountain town. This not only marks the important time of the global uncertainty, it's also the 50th anniversary of the global platform, which emphasized from the very beginning the importance of stakeholders. This year, the idea is revitalized, suggesting business not only responsible for shareholders, but also consumers and communities. The forum began with speeches given by leaders from China and the United States. Let's first of all listen to this. U.S. President Donald Trump. Just last week alone, the United States concluded two extraordinary trade deals, the agreement with China and the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, the two biggest trade deals ever made. They just happened to get done in the same week. These agreements represent a new model of trade for the 21st century, agreements that are fair, reciprocal, and that prioritize the needs of workers and families. America's economic turnaround has been nothing short of spectacular when I took office three years ago. Now, let's listen to this. Han Zheng, Chinese Vice Premier at the World Economic Forum. To resolve the difficulties and problems in economic globalization, the key lies in upholding multilateralism. We should keep to the goal of safeguarding peace, promoting development, upholding equity and justice, and pursuing mutual benefit and win-win outcomes, and work together to tackle global challenges such as poverty reduction, climate change, and environmental protection. The forum this year begins right after the first phase of trade deals signed between China and the United States. In an in-depth interview with Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, he told me about whether that truth is sustainable. Here is the interview. Professor Schwab, what a pleasure to see you on the 50th edition of the World Economic Forum. And it's a great pleasure to see you back just before Chinese New Year. Exactly. This is a wonderful time to reflect on and to look forward. One of the things of the backdrop for this year's World Economic Forum has a lot to do with the phase one deal signed between China and the United States. How do you see events like this will be making it possible for the international community to come to consensus? It's a very important step forward and I'm very happy that this deal was signed just before the annual meeting opens because it provides uh, new confidence into the future of the economy. But uh, we still have an important step to go and I hope uh, that the strong presence of business leaders here, of political leaders will help to move forward not only related to the trade deal but also related to many other issues which we have to face in the world of today. Professor, in the World Economic Forum Global Risks Report, it indicated major power rivalry now has become one of the biggest dangers the world is facing right now. Now, how much is that reflected in the China-US issue and how do you think this big rivalry or big power rivalry issue can be discussed and communicated? 
I think it has to be discussed, and it has to be discussed not only on an official uh, high level. I think uh, uh, if we have dialogues in an informal way, even among the young people who are here, or uh, particularly the business people who are here, if technology companies from the US meet directly technology companies from China, I think those contacts uh, lead to a better mutual understanding and the mutual understanding is the base for making progress to create a framework how we solve uh, the pertinent issues. Mm. Professor Schwab, the World Economic Forum from the very beginning has been well known to being a conciliatory and reconciled stage for many global issues. But some say this time China and the U.S. is going to be different. This is going to be, quote unquote, a new Cold War. Do you agree with those comments? I, I no, I don't like this uh, uh, statement because um, we know that sometimes uh, prophecies, prophecies have a tendency to self-fulfill. Um, I think we have to make every effort to avoid the situation you just described because the uh, ultimate um, result would be uh, two circles with the own rules uh, and this would certainly not be um, in the interest of humankind uh, because it would, as you said, it would be a cold war but much more a technology war. So you have the U.S. President coming to this year's World Economic Forum. Meanwhile, the Chinese Vice Premier is also going to be here to deliver his speech. What are your expectations for them and the other leaders? I'm expecting that everybody uh, embraces the double spirit, which means to emphasize much more what is common and not what uh, puts us apart. And even if there are issues which, uh, let's say, are difficult to resolve, uh, we want to hear, um, if possible, uh, solutions of how we can go forward. Professor, you are putting forward the fourth industrial revolution idea over the past few years. And we have seen technologies have been changing so rapidly since then. But now, here's the thing. What about technological decoupling. How much do you think your idea of the fourth industrial revolution with the danger of technology decoupling is right in front of us? How does that work? Uh, you address a number of uh, issues. Uh, the first one, I'm, I believe that technology uh, can help us to resolve many of the global issues, can really advance to sustainable development goals and uh, particularly um, CO2 emissions and so on can be substantially uh, reduced if we take full advantage of new technologies. I think this is even the main reason, if there are other ones, uh, to make sure that we work together because uh, the environmental challenge is a global challenge. You cannot create a separation line. We all are interdependent. So even if we want to address the ecological challenge, we have to work together to use the technologies at its best. Mm. To use technologies at best, it means smooth circulation of talents, of knowledge, of information, of exchanges? Yes, as the world has seen um, in the last 40 years with globalization that um, it, uh, it's a very uh, beneficial force for the global economy and if I compare with 40 years ago, I think uh, we have made enormous uh, process not only in increasing GDP but creating a better quality of life. Our uh, life expectations have uh, been extended. Um, I would say we have to continue on this path, but we also have to know that today the argument that you have more winners than losers is not any more really convincing. 
because we see social media, we see attention giving to those who are left behind. You have to make sure that you have inclusive global goals. Talking about inclusiveness, Professor, this year you have been pointing out stakeholder capitalism, which you pointed out, shall I say, in back in the 1973. I think you wrote an article about this also. But things have changed. So stakeholder capitalism, will it really work? Well, companies are still looking for profits as their ultimate goal, even though they also want to, on the sideline, take care of the consumers and communities. There is no um, alternative to stakeholder uh, responsibility. Um, we are living in a new world. The world has changed. When I conceptualized glo uh, stakeholder responsibility in a book in 1970-71, I had to fight now the last 50 years uh, to really get the idea adapted because there was Milton Friedman, the famous economist who said the moral obligation of business is to make profits. But today we are living in a different world because people have different expectations and um, people will not work anymore for companies who really destroy our environment. They will not work for companies who are not socially responsible. So to embrace stakeholder capitalism is in the interest of companies to ensure the long-term prosperity and profitability of the company. But the benchmark of CEOs, short-term only, and it's the profits that are using as their payment benchmark as well. So are we talking about a wonderful goal, but the reality is pretty skinny? No. I uh, First, at, at the meeting, we will develop a co comprehensive concept of ESG uh, measurements, which means how can we measure, like we measure profit, how can we measure environmental, social, and good government's responsibility. You look at the Manifesto 2020 of the World Economic Forum, which describes stakeholder responsibility. We say that um, executive remuneration should be not only in line with the profitability, but also with the social responsibility and environmental responsibility and good governance practices the company has installed. You are inventing a revolution, I'm afraid, the Professor Schwab. I hope so, <laughs> because um, I think uh, uh, companies will not be credible if uh, they do not show that uh, a corporation is not just an economic unit, it's a social organism. It has a very big importance in our social life. And um, this means to assume those responsibilities. This year, 50th anniversary of the World Economic Forum, we really should say big congratulations to you, Professor, and your team. But many wonder what would be the biggest takeaway you would have as someone behind the scenes on a daily basis working on this platform. Biggest lessons, biggest experiences, biggest takeaways. I think the, the biggest takeaway is that the world today, the world not only of hard power but soft power, the world where we have to f search for unity in diversity, needs a platform like the World Economic Forum. So the platform which I have created is independent on my own personality. I think it's a gift to the world and um, I hope that this platform in the future can be of major um, help and utility when we address all the issues which require, as President Xi Jinping said, we are part of a global community with the same destiny. So we have to work together to make sure that the next generations find a world which is even better than the world we have inherited. Last few questions. You've been traveling to China, Professor Schwab, frequently. 
once or twice or even three times every year, you got a medal, a national honor medal coming from the Chinese president. What do you make of this country, China, which many have been observing for decades, but still there seems to be very mixed, shall I say, analysis? Yes, um, maybe as a European, I see Europe uh, working together, sometimes with difficulties, despite the diversity which we have. And um, I think we have to recognize that China has a long, very proud cultural tradition dating back many centuries. Uh, China is the largest country in terms of population and soon the strongest country in terms of economy. So um, we have to treat uh, China with respect, sometimes with admiration, and we have to make sure that China takes a very responsible and responsive role in global affairs. China is uh, participating with the strongest delegation, um, over 100 people, um, despite the new year. And uh, I hope that they can enjoy a new year also in Davos. And we hope that will be the same for you, Professor, and the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so I'm much, excited. sir. All the best. Thank you. If you realize how much the world has changed and how anxious we are about uncertainties, you will not be surprised by the coming showdown in the snowy Swiss mountain village of Davos. Participants are from all corners, teenage environmental activists to state leaders, billionaires to futurists. And I'm here too, bringing you all the latest and insights. Let's see whether we have the guts and the result for a sustainable and cohesive world. Zhu Min, National Institute of Financial Research President, is formerly Deputy Managing Director of the IMF and also served as Vice Governor of China's Central Bank. I discussed with him on the sideline of the World Economic Forum the latest situation with the Chinese economy and what does it mean to slow down in GDP numbers and about the health, particularly, of the economy today in China. Governor Zhu, what a pleasure to see you at the World Economic Forum. Well, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you because I have a lot of questions for you. Okay. Phase one trade deal signed between China and the United States. How sustainable will this choose, as some say? I think it should be a sustainable deal, I mean, because it's clearly on the U.S. side, I think the U.S. need a deal because it's a help to U.S., uh, you know, and agro products to, to exports and also for the manufacturing things, and I think that's also important for the U.S. I, I, so in that sense, I think Trump should stick on the deal. On the China side, actually, and China will import those goods to meet the domestic demand. And also China committed to the further reform uh, in terms of financial market opening and in terms of uh, more broadly protection of IP and improve the business environments, which is also important for China because when China moving from $10,000 per capita uh, income to the high income, mm -hmm. in that time, open up, introduce international competition is really the key. But you know, Governor Zhu, many are suggesting whether some of the concerns we have seen in the deal, because we need to raise them line by line, right? Many of the right. industries are doing so right now, uh, actually appear elsewhere in other Chinese documents anyway earlier. So is there much China really committed, some ask? Indeed, China committed. For, for example, China committed to the IP protections in the G20 and also within domestic uh, the documents in many ways. China committed to improve the business environment in many ways. So all those things, the reason I feel confident, I think the both will stick on the deal, because particularly from China side, this is good for China, good for Chinese economies in the future. So I think, so that's the reason I think uh, the deal is sustainable. But what about the financial sector? I mean, many of the things listed in the document actually were earlier commitments China already made for the years to come. Right, that's true. I mean, in, in 
And really, uh, if you're looking for the whole thing, in the deal, we agreed to broadly open China's financial sector, and not only banking sector, but equity market, uh, you know, security companies, uh, funds, you know, readings, you know, and the third party payments, and, yeah. and all those things. Uh, which actually, for example, President Xi Jinping announced in Boao is April 2018 so already. And uh, since then, we also observed many, many open door policies in, in those days. So as I said, this is really important and good for Chinese economy and move forward. So I think China will very much stick on this commitment. $200 billion purchase would not be much problem for China over the next two years? Yeah, because there's a clear definition, say it's 200 billion, but also have to be a, a competitive price. Mm -hmm. So that means that's the important. market is important. Yeah. And also, they have to meet China's domestic market need. So U.S. cannot dumping anything to China, I think it's, a, it's make it very clear, which obviously this term is a, is a key issue for both sides and negotiators for quite long, but at the end, the U.S. accept the China language, I think China standard, because obviously you want to export, so you have to basis on the market mm -hmm. competitiveness, right? So in that sense, we import more from the U.S. Actually, it's important things to meet the Chinese domestic need. Mm -hmm. So it's good for both. But still, $360 billion Chinese export to the United States being tariffed. Now, many wonder, once the phase one deal is signed, what about that part, at least from Chinese perspective, what about that part? So we very much hope the U.S. will gradually cutting the tariff against the Chinese uh, goods. Um, in the, the, the deal, there's one sense the tariff can only go down but not go up. I mm -hmm. think that's a very important sentence. So in that sense, we can expect to see the tariff gradually cutting down. But as you may know, in the political year of the election, a lot of things are very vulnerable in terms of the U.S. ambience. And therefore, plus a leadership that sometimes could be described as unpredictable, how much people really wonder, even here at the World Economic Forum, about the U.S. capability to fulfill its promises. So far, what you hear from the U.S. Uh, from Lighthizer, from uh, Trump, uh, are they all committed to those deals because they feel this deal is good for U.S. and good for China mm. and good for the whole world. So I hope U.S. will be able to keep the deals. Mm. Of course, U.S.-China relations, economic-wise, is one thing that is having an impact on the Chinese economy, particularly when it comes to the atmosphere. However, what is going on in the real Chinese economy is a very, very important issue. 6.1 percent, uh, uh, Governor Drew, growth rate. I'm not saying growth rate lower, it will be worse, but rather if it is with great quality. So what do you think about the warnings, both the Chinese President Xi Jinping and the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang gave out earlier about so-called difficult times, hardships, it doesn't mean Chinese economy are going to go further downward and huge pressure. I think growth will slow down, but policy and improve more balanced, I think that's the key issue. Right? We also did studies, what we see and when China moving into this stage, China moving to more service sector, so improve the service sector productivity become really important, which require more reform, you know, open door policies and technology policies. With all those policies support, uh, China will be able to stabilize the economy in some degree. So mm -hmm. not necessarily where sort of everybody thinks growth will you know, dra dramatically slow down. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. And internationally, there are a lot of uncertainties. So in that sense, I, I, I really don't think we, have, we need to focus too much on the number of growth. We need to focus on the quality, make sure the growth is much more balanced, and, and make sure the growth is in line with international trends. You think about that, and uh, the whole world have 2.9 percent growth rate, the lowest one since 2008, mm -hmm. right? And this year, the growth and also be moderate in around 3.1. So in that environment, the Chinese growth rate is around 6 percent is very 
reasonable. But some suggest the 6.5 percent, that was uh, where the economy was in uh, 2018. Now from then, that was the slowest growth rate uh, since the 1990s, uh, the, that we will look at the speed. And now everything going downward, uh, if you look at the numbers, I'm saying. Uh, so how would we guarantee the quality? With you know, international comparisons, we realize when you uh, have a big economy, your growth is uh, tend to slow down. Mm -hmm. So any minute you will say, hey, China has the lowest of growth rates. It doesn't matter, right? Because it's much bigger. Yeah. And incremental part is also much, much bigger, even with the low growth rates, right? Every year there's a growth uh, of the, you know, the qu quantity of Australia or yeah, the quantity yeah. of Indonesia. Yeah, you know? no, it's a, it's a huge economy. So I think number per se is, is, is really uh, not it. But the quality, yeah. The quality means many things. I, I, in, in, in one end, an environmental protection yeah. is obviously good quality. I think that if you're looking for Beijing air quality, it's much better. Income inequality, you know, and also to make sure the pensions, the medical assistance, more equal, more fair, cover broadly by, by the people, make people happy. I think that's a quality which currently China is doing now. I think that's very important. And also, people have a choice to pick the much quality goods they need when they become the, the middle income country mm -hmm. to the high income middle class, have more money to spend. So open door for import of China first one to build import exhibitions. I think those things make people happy. Mm -hmm. Job number is extremely important. Let's talk about the job numbers. What have you noticed so far? Well, I think the job number continues to improve because every, everyone in China have a roughly 12 million people you know, to, 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 to get into the jobs, so, which, is, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, so I think in that time, uh, I expect to see China will continue to able to provide 12 million jobs in roughly year 2020. So job number is important. If you talk the air quality, you know, mm -hmm. you think of job numbers, uh, people's social security baskets, you know, people's happiness to enjoy more variety of the consumption goods, uh, in that sense, and I think at the behind the whole thing, this economic structure has mm -hmm. been reshaping and shifting toward more balanced things, less investments, less import. I think in that sense, I would say the quality is indeed improving. But what about the quality? One of the things is state-owned sector vis-a-vis -vis private sector. That has been an issue covered so much in the international press. So what about that? Where is China now? I think SOE reform is the key issues on the agenda of a government reform plans. I um, mean, SOE reforms mean many things. The first issue is make a SOE act active on the basis on the competitiveness in the rules and the field. I think that's one thing. Actually, this is one thing we experience in doubles. You can hear many Chinese SOE talk about their compete with anyone in the field, right? I mean, it's nothing preferential policy toward a particular them. Mixed ownership is another issue, so we try to mm. bring the private sectors, uh, invest in the, the SOEs to make sure it's changing the ownership structure, change the governance issues is second issue. And also keep the neutrality is a very important issue to maintain a fair business environment. I think that's also a big issue for 20, 2020. What does that mean, keep the neutrality? Neutrality means that everybody is equal, fair footed in the competition, in the market, no preferential policy toward some particular parties. So I think that's the key issue I will expect to see in the SOE reform, which is also important for China's growth in the next decade. But the debt issue for the private sector, particularly now, we have seen it being a big concern for the country's economy. That is a big issue, particularly uh, corporate debt is way high compared with international norms, I think, in the SOEs in the, in the, in the private sectors. But I, good news, the debt has been stabilized. Actually, SOE debt ratio has been cutting roughly 4.5% in the past two years. Stabilization of uh, leverage ratio, I think that's the most important thing. What about the, the private sector? On the private sector, that's there's also no change. No, in the private sector, the death ratio is on downside. So clearly, I, I think we see the cop sector deleveraging really move fast, which is it's a good sense. Governor Zhu, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me.
still to come on World Insight with Tian Wei. The power of joy and hope through music. A female conductor makes audiences stop, look, and listen. If you realize how much the world has changed and how anxious we are about uncertainties, you will not be surprised by the coming showdown in the snowy Swiss mountain village of Davos. Participants are from all corners, teenage environmental activists to state leaders, billionaires to futurists. And I'm here too, bringing you all the latest and insights. Let's see whether we have the guts and resolve for a sustainable and cohesive world. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too, by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei. Go beyond the headlines. Despair, fear is in the air as a result of the global uncertainty. That is felt at the World Economic Forum this year. But that should not be all. According to Marin Alsop, music director of Baltimore Symphony, also first women conductor of the Vienna Radio Symphony, who told me about her Ode to Joy world tour, including performances at this year's World Economic Forum. We need to, she said, really listen well to each other. That's what's been trying to do through her music and also through her cooperation with artists around the world. Mary, what a pleasure to have you on CGTN. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Congratulations for the opening night of the World Economic Forum. Beautiful performance. Thank you. We're so excited to be here. And also, first ever, women conductor for Vienna Radio Symphony. Wow. That makes me very proud, but I hope it, it can open up doors for more women. More and more, isn't it? That's, you know, the, the opportunities are finally starting. Uh, but in 2002, I started a fellowship for women conductors because there were so few women. Now I'm thrilled that more and more women are having opportunities. Now you are starting not only here at the World Economic Forum, but global campaign called Ode to Joy. Now that's symphony number no. nine of Beethoven. Right. right. Well, the idea behind this is it's two, the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, and I wanted to reimagine the Ninth Symphony for our 21st century audiences. So we have nine new texts on the same themes, but with more connection, more relevance mm -hmm. to today's audiences. And we're taking it to six continents with 11 different orchestras. Congratulations. But I noticed that you didn't choose the other pieces, but rather Symphony Number no. 9. Well, you know, I think that's the most iconic Beethoven sure. work. And also the message of unity and hope and, you know, real triumph over 
um, pessimism. And I think today we need that. We need to feel optimistic and hopeful. Is that an artist uh, effort to save the world? Oh yes, my little effort to <laughs> save the world. Yeah. <laughs>
and you focus on that, you know your ears open up. Do you feel it? As I you're do breathing? feel it. Your ears open up. It's a matter of being in the moment. And I think that's what we all strive for. So listening is a part of existing in this moment. How to also be able to communicate across culture. That's also you are trying to overcome the cultural barriers through your project. To you, what is the way? Well, you know, by immersing myself in these different locations, these different cultures, and really trying to be open to what, what resonates with each culture, mm -hmm. I'm learning and experiencing and enjoying and, and the people I'm working with are proud. And so it, it just feels like a, a great celebration to me. Open up. Yep. That's open the idea. up. And I want to open up more to your music, uh, Marion. So. Uh, would you like to leave with us one or two tunes you can hum oh, for today us? Today we have to hum the Ode to Joy, okay? You yes. have to hum. Yes, okay, I'll come go da, with you. You ready? All right, yes. Da, 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 da. I go with oh, you. Conducting. Yeah, yeah, okay. She's taking over. I'm just going to leave. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Marie, so good to see you. <laughs>